what do you want in a mate? If you're a woman, you might say, well, you know, you want someone who's kind and loving and forgiving and empathic. And those are all good things. But, but it isn't necessarily the case that the empirical studies show that that's what drives mate selection. So we could look. This is an interesting study. So it's a few years old. 1,000 French-Canadian respondents. 433 males and 700 females. And so here, here are the variables. One is possession of resources. It's a composite index composed of occupational prestige, income and education. And then the other variable is acquisition of partners, sexual partners, that is. Number of lifetime and preceding year sexual partners, lifetime occurrence of simultaneous partners, which is a yes or no variable, and lifetime frequency of simultaneous partners, one to five, with five being very often. Here's the assumption. You can you know, decide for yourself if you think this is a warranted assumption. The number of partners a member of sex A acquires is taken as an index of how often this individual is chosen by sex B. So that's an indication of re reproductive fitness, desirability, at least as assessed by members of the opposite sex, who you would think would be the logical judges for that sort of thing. Male criteria. 166 unattached women ages 25 to 50. Correlation between fertility rates and number of partners in previous year equals 0.94. Males choose fertility. Indicators. Beauty. Waist to hip ratio, youthful appearance, and neotenous facial features. Neotenous means there's a tendency among animals as they evolve to increasingly look more in their adult stages like their juvenile forms. So if, here's, here's an example. If, if you look at the skull of a baby chimpanzee, it looks almost exactly like the skull of an adult human. So what's happened is we've, as adults, we're more like baby chimpanzees than, than the adult chimpanzees are. We've, we've, we've what, maintained a lot of our juvenile characteristics, playfulness, you know, the ability to continue to learn, plasticity, all those things. Um, there's a preference in objective beauty analysis, say, of facial features for men to prefer more neotenous female faces. So, and you can tell that if you look at pictures of models. They generally have relatively small noses, relatively big eyes. The sort of things that are associated with cute, and cute actually is a pretty, a pretty identifiable category. Most of the things that people find cute have large eyes, and relatively, the rest of their facial features are relatively small. There's other things that are associated with cute that aren't necessarily associated with you know, sexual attractiveness, because cute things also have sort of random movements, like baby-like movements. And so the things that people, and you know, relatively short arms, and just think of a teddy bear. So anyways, those are the male, those are the male criteria. Female criteria, all respondents. Correlation between socioeconomic status and frequency of simultaneous partners. For men, it was 0.49. That's a big correlation. For women, it was 0 0.04. That's zero, fundamentally. So the correlation between male socioeconomic status and frequency of simultaneous partners is 0.5. It's a huge effect. For women, it's zero. Now, that's a big difference. So, you know, one of the things you might ask yourself, too, I don't know if this is a reasonable thing to, to ask or not, but I've always thought that the hard people to explain are the people who are hyper-achievers, you know, the ones who are way out on the Pareto distribution. And there aren't very many of them, and they're usually, they're usually men. You know, so if you look at the median num number of publications, for example, that a female academic makes and a male academic, they're pretty much the same. But the mean for men is higher, and that's all driven by a small subset of men who are way the hell out in the Pareto distribution. Now you might ask, well, why is that? Well, it's simple. If you want to be way out on the Pareto distribution, so you're in the top, say, 1% of performers, or even one-tenth of 1% of performers, what do you have to do? Well, first, having an IQ of like 145 or above, that's really helpful. Then you should be insanely industrious. So maybe you'll work 90 hours a week, or 100 hours a week, at nothing but your stupid occupation. And maybe you'll do that for like 50 years. And so if you do that, well, you're going to be in that top one in 1,000 category. Well, the issue isn't why there are so few women in that category. The issue is why are there any men at all in that category? 
right? Because it's, it's an insane lifestyle in many ways. You know, um, it, it means that there isn't much left there for the rest of your life. You're hyper-concentrating on a single thing. Now, why would men do that? Well, here's a hypothesis. One of the things that drives the probability that a woman will find a man attractive enough to sleep with is his status. So then you can think, well, that's an extra motivational boost for men. Now, whether that's conscious motivational boost or not is not the point. The question is, is it a, is it a boost that might have been instantiated as an evolutionary element of general motivation? Well, men are more competitive, they're more disagreeable. And if they're more disagreeable and more competitive, they seem to do better, especially in high-status jobs. And then women are more likely to pick men like that for sexual partners. So it's, at some point it becomes difficult to avoid the conclusion, especially since we know that the men on the way out on the tail end of the Pareto distribution are disproportionately likely to sleep with many women. So Warren Beatty, I think, 15,000? That was his estimate, 15,000 women. And uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the basketball player, he figured 10,000. So and so for, the, for every one guy who's got those numbers racked up, that's 10,000 guys who don't. So the male success distribution is extreme. And it's associated with outlier success in some important dimension of socio-economic success and then female reproductive opportunity is not so, you know, is that relevant? well, you know, it depends on how you think it's hard for me to see that it can't be relevant so, questions? you had a question? 